So I said, now you know that's a lie. She said, yes, I know that's a lie. And so I said, well, what are you now? Here's I just what what are you going to do when you stand before the great creator? You know what this seat said? She said something a lot of people that have a quote unquote Christian background say. She said, I'll ask forgiveness. See, she knows in her conscience she's just sinned against the, the creator of the universe. All right? So I'm, I'm wanting to try to do Bible studies and lay out lessons, and this is one. And I'm going to kind of teach, preach this, uh, but you have some likes there, and I have uh, a teacher's a guide as well. And I have this series that I... I'm going to print off for everybody here, but I am going to tell the pastors who are here, if you are interested in this, probably the best thing for me to do would be to email you a copy, and you can tweak it, you know, take some things out, put some things in as you feel necessary. It's not uh, something that, you know, that I'm, I, I put it together, okay, I make, make my own bread here. Uh, so, and any of the material that I gave you yesterday, uh, you're free to take and use that however you want. That's, that was made in my oven. So you use this as you feel as you feel led. Okay? But again, it's a five lesson series on the gospel. We're just going to use lesson one so you get some idea of how it goes. Now, if I were doing this with a person, I'd be sitting down next to them. All right? Or across the table, but somewhere close to them. And I'd probably be following along with my pen. You know, just line upon line, precept upon precept. Okay, here a little, there a little. Uh, because they may have questions, and I think it's very good if they do have questions. Or we might stop, uh, like look at that first line. The Bible books of Matthew through Acts are transitional books. They might not even know what the word transition means. Books between the Jews, write that in, the Jews, J-E-W-S, the Jews of the Old Testament and people living today. And then I would probably show them in my New Testament. Okay, these are the books of Matthew through Acts. Then the next line refers to Revelation, the end of the New Testament. And so I state that the book of Revelation is primarily about things that will happen in the future around the time that Jesus Christ returns from heaven. The 21 books between Acts and Revelation give us very important truth about salvation. Christian living and what churches are and how they are to act in this world. So I, I like to get the bird's eye view. That's just me, you know, to try to give some sort of background. And I think you have to do that today. We even do that when we're, when we're preaching. Did you notice how our context is here? And, you know, any text without a context is a pretext. So it's very important that you, you, you know, maybe talk about the verses ahead. We know that as people who believe in Bible interpretation, hermeneutics, big word we use. And that's important. Well, you might be dealing with a lady like I dealt with on the plane from Sydney up to Cairns. And I asked her her religious background, which is what I asked that girl this morning. I said, what's your religious background? And she told me. All right, so that's what I asked this lady on the plane, three-hour plane trip, and she said she was Buddhist. I said, well, what does a Buddhist believe? I kind of knew, but I wanted to. So basically, it's a good works religion. You know? All religions are either do or done. Okay, ours is a done religion. Every other religion is a do religion. You can categorize them do or done, right? So hers is a do religion. And I asked her the same question. Have you ever seen a Bible? She'd seen a Bible. I said, has anybody ever explained the Bible to you? And I took the next two hours on the plane to open this Thompson Chain Reference King James Bible and just lay it out there and show her from a bird's eye view this is God's message from God to man to show you how you can know him. And she's sitting there, just nobody had ever done it. She was from Toronto. I was from South Africa. Who do you think ordained that seating assignment? <laughs> uh, these 21 books are divided into two primary sections. The first 13 books were written by a man named Paul. Now, that's elementary to you, but it may not be to somebody else, who mostly preached and wrote to those folks who were not Jews. Well, that's you and me. I mean, for the most part. The Bible calls these people, Ephesians 3, let's call them, Gentiles. And 
I would turn there and show them that. See, Jews and Gentiles. All right? Now, salvation is of the Jews. You and I know that. That was stated earlier, okay? Doesn't mean you have to become a Jew. But I just talking about Christ. But anyway, the last eight books were written by other prophets who mostly preached and wrote to the Jews. Or in the Bible, the circumcision. When I first got to South Africa, somebody asked me this. Ruki, what does the Bible say about circumcision? Now, I did not know what they were asking. Because from my frame of reference, well, circumcision referred to the Jews. You know what they were thinking of? What their tribe does as initiation rites to become a man in that tribe. All right? So, you're talking to a people group that believes in circumcision, which means, okay, let's go out on the mountain, five or six hundred boys, let the witch doctors teach us, and after they teach us, then they perform circumcision out in the bush and run the risk of death, and some do. And if a boy dies, they send a trusted young man out during the night to his house and throw his clothes over the fence into the yard. Parents <coughs> wake up the next morning and see the, boys with their clothes, the clothes of their boy. They know he's died in tribal circumcision and that he's been buried out there in the bush. That happens. So circumcision, you're sitting down with a South African or a Zimbabwean and talking about circumcision, you better... Well, now, in the Bible, the word circumcision is referred to the Jews, and this was their, their practice, you know, to become a Jew. And they had some sort of an idea of that, but I said, don't let your ideas of circumcision cloud this, okay? But they might have some questions about it, like they, this guy did with me. What's the Bible say about circumcision? And, and we have to be careful when we're doing Bible studies about getting sidetracked. However, I think if you will say, okay, the Bible has an answer for that, and be familiar enough with your Bible study so that you can say, that's going to get answered in the next few weeks. Or, give them a brief answer from the Bible to show them the Bible has the answers to their questions. But, you know, you have to kind of keep things on track here. Because devilish distractions, we talked about that the other night, how the devil can use those things. Now, Romans is the first book in this first section, and thus is very important to everyone in our day, whether they are a true Christian or not. Now, a lot of people profess to be Christians. Uh, I, I'm, I'm careful about even using the term born again. I know it's a Bible term, but you know, born again today can mean anything from anywhere to anywhere. So I like to say this. Have you been born again the Bible way? Or are you saved the Bible way? That's what I like to use. <clears throat> and then that makes them think. Oh. Now, this book of Romans can be divided into two primary parts. You see how we're kind of getting this... We're, we're, Really narrowing things down here. So we talked about the New Testament, Romans, two parts, and so on and so forth. The first 11 chapters are doctrinal, and that means teaching. Doctrine means teaching. They're, they lay a foundation. And the last five chapters are practical. That means how to live out what you're taught. I said, you know why you do some things that you do? Because you were taught those things. And so God wants us to learn these things and then live these things. So, again, line up on line, precept, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to use some simple concepts here. Our purpose in these studies is to view just the first five chapters of the book where the writer Paul lays out for us the gospel. These chapters divide further into five main lessons. And so the first lesson we look at today is what we call an introduction to the gospel. So if you've got your Bible open to Romans chapter 1 there, we're going to work our way down through it. Now, what I might do at this point is just read the text, Romans 1, 1 through 17. Um, and I would be careful. You, can, you kind of have to know the... Now, if, if you're one-on-one -on -one and the person understands English pretty good, they're not going to be afraid to do that. But you ought to be familiar enough with the text so that maybe you read the first five verses and look at verse number six. And you say, can you read that verse for us? And all of a sudden, here's this lost person finding himself reading the Word of God in simple English, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. And they might even pronounce, mispronounce the word ye. Yeah. Tithy. What's a tithy? See, languages like Sutu pronounce every vowel. So I'm Jerry Wilhitty. So they might say, yeah, or ye. A tithy is a tithe. All right? So, but one of these simple ones you might 
you might, or you might say, read along with me. Let's read this verse out loud together. And you're getting them accustomed. You know, I'm not trying to use pragmatism here. I'm not trying to, you know, uh, but I am trying to get them. You know, they need to see that the Bible is for them. They can read this. They can understand. It's not a book that is so difficult. And a lot of times I'll say, you know, I don't even understand all the Bible. I was doing a Bible study one time in a village. had about 10 or 11 ladies there and one guy who was interpreting for me. And so I knew it probably wasn't going to go very far, but I was there. And so I, I asked him the question. I said, do you think that, we, we looked at the verse, all have sinned. I said, do you think that Maruti has sinned? And they were afraid to answer. I said, now what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? The Bible says all. That means everybody. So does that include Maruti? What does the Bible say? I kept bringing them back. What does God say? What does the Bible say? What? And when I finally got to that point, well, what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible says everybody. I said, does that include me? And they kind of didn't want to nod, but they did. They were afraid. Again, there's that culture, you know, afraid to say yes. But I said, you've got to let the Bible. You can't let man. The fear of man brings what? Brings a snare. Okay? So you've got to let the Bible dictate what you believe. <laughs> And I, I don't spend a lot of time on this outline. You can see it's alliterated. That's, you know, alliteration is for illiterates, okay? So that's why I alliterate. <laughs> I'm illiterate. <laughs> but anyway, it kind of gives you and I the, the idea here of the introduction to the gospel, which we look at, the iniquity, that sin that requires the gospel, the importance of the gospel, and then illustrations. There are two illustrations in chapter 4, Abraham and David. Um, one by his, an actual event in his life, and then David, by what he says, okay, so he's using a two-pronged approach there to say, these people really came to know the Lord. There was a time and a place where they came to know the Lord. And then the impact, chapter 5, really deals with, okay, once I've gotten saved, okay, what are some expectations? Once I've received the gospel, okay, what is my standing, you know, before the Lord? Now, that next paragraph, the word gospel is found 13 times in this book and four times in the introduction. Which is, is, is let's look at it here. Let's look at verse number 9. And can I get a volunteer? Thank you, David. Would you read verse 9? And verse 15. Bobby Jr. Is that you? I don't know if you're Bobby Jr. or Bobby III. So, as much as it is, I really preach the gospel to you that are your life. And Brother Sutton, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes in it, to the Jew first and also to the Jew. Okay, so I'm just highlighting, pointing out the word gospel, gospel, gospel. And then you might even turn to chapter 2, verse 16. and and chapter 10, and just help them see this is a book on the gospel. That, now, that might be as far as you get in an hour session. And that's fine. That's fine. You know, you want to give them something they can take home and chew on, think about, and so they walk away saying, you know, the gospel is something the book of Romans is about. So they come back the next week, and, or maybe a couple days later, I don't know, you know, give, give the Spirit of God time to use some of these things and say, well, what's the book of Romans about? What's well, about the gospel? Is it found several times? Yes, it's found several times. Okay, so they, they learn something. Now, it's minimal. It's, it's kindergarten, but they, they grasp something. So now you can build on this. All right, well, uh, it means, well, I would probably go through this paragraph anyway, but it is a word that means, who knows what it means? We've heard it said several times. It means good news, all right? So we got the two blanks there, good news. And it's translated from a Greek word. You say, huh? All right, now that might be important, but you might say, well, the New Testament was written in the Greek language. And one of the things that I like about the language where we were working is that their Sutu Bible is also based upon the Textus Receptus. Isn't that something? And so I can say to them, you know, your Bible and my Bible are based upon a Greek language that we can trust. And the reason it was written in Greek is because it's a very, very precise language to really show us that what this gospel is and how we are to live. By the way, the Sutu languages, they use about 1,500 words in their daily vocabulary. We use about 5,500. 
So the Sutu Bible is going to have some, well, like they don't have a word for, for chariot. The word for car is kaloi. So Abraham, or, uh, uh, Elijah went to heaven in a kaloi. All right, so what you have to do when you're training these men is, okay, it's not a four-wheel car, and you kind of have to maybe draw a picture and say this is a this is a two-wheel thing, and you're gonna and, that, and you're gonna have to coin a word or explain Kaloe to them in their language. Okay, we're, we're we're elementary, but that's fine. That was one of the worries I had about coming to Brother Brandenburg's conference. I said, I want you to know, I'm just I, I've just been dealing with elementary truths. But it sounds like and looks like our word evangelist. Evangelist. I would not try, I, I, I would not try to pronounce a, a Greek word. I probably butcher it anyway, so I just say it sounds like our English word evangelist. And they, they know that. Okay, so let's look at the preacher of the gospel, Romans chapter 1, verse 1. I want you to read it out loud with me together. Romans chapter 1, verse number 1, out loud together. And I say that several times so that you know. Let's read it out loud. Okay, we'll read it out loud. Romans 1.1, 1, 1. you say that reference several times even though you're there. It's the first verse. Now a lot of them, a lot of them will say that the verse is the chapter. So they will say Romans chapter 1, or they'll say Romans 1 chapter 1. Now part of that is, they don't know that's a verse. So chapter 1, and I say, you see it right up there, that's a chapter. So this whole thing is a chapter. You see this chapter has 32 verses. In fact, if I had a board up here, I'd show you how, well, you can see there how we just assume that 1-1, one, one, everybody knows what that is, 1 colon 1, we assume that means chapter 1, verse 1, a lot of them don't know that. What's that 1 colon 1, full stop? Well, that first number means the chapter, and the next one means the verse. So we're going to look over here at the chapter, and then the verse, but look in your Bible, there's not even a 1 there, it's just a big P. Okay, well, that's the first verse. See, if they put a one in there, it'd be... All right, so let's read it out loud together. All right, chapter 1, verse 1. Ready? Starts out with Paul. Ready? Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Okay, let's look at our notes. The writer of this book is Paul. You can read about his conversion to Christ in Acts 9. That's chapter 9. I wouldn't turn there, but... You know, that might be an assigned reading for them after the lesson. And you show them where it is. You say, see, Acts is right before Romans, so you can find it. And you got a ribbon in your Bible there? Okay, put that ribbon right there. And then just go back to Acts. Remember, that's chapter 9. That's not verse 9. Okay, go to, and you start reading there. You'll read about this man, how he believed the gospel. And then see, his life changed. God used him to write about the gospel. And so, you know, you're wedding there. After, these are real people. And this was his life. Oh, he was persecuting people. And he got saved. He got received his God. Life changed. <clears throat> All right, so back to our notes. Before he was saved, he was religious, but he hated born-again Christians. So he greatly persecuted them. After he was saved, his name was changed from Saul to Paul, and he became persecuted. Oh, now let that thought sink in on him. Even today, there are many, many religious people who are lost and hate true believers. What does lost mean? Define lost. Define basic. Define ba the reason I use foundation is because when they build their houses or a church building, they lay a foundation. So, so I use the word foundation. I use the word basic because... Oh, that sounds like bass. And, and they use a bass when they play a game. But is that basic? Sick? Sounds like sick. Now, I'm not trying to teach their head, but, you know, there is some of that. Okay. Sorry. How does Paul describe, um, how does Paul describe himself in this verse? And you say, okay, how does he describe himself? So let's take a volunteer. How does he describe himself? A servant of who? Of Jesus Christ. And then he says he was called to be an apostle. Now, there's a lot of big words there and concepts. I'm not going to 
belabor that. It's not necessarily a verse by verse commentary through this. But I just want them to say, okay, here's the East. He's, he's instrumental here in giving us this gospel. And letter B, when Paul says that he was separated unto the gospel, he means that God called him out of the masses. Probably a better word might be people or vast amounts of people. To be saved and then to tell others the gospel. In Galatians 1.15, he looked back at his life from the time he was born and saw how God had worked in his life even before he was saved to bring him to salvation and to make him a gospel preacher. Once you are saved, you see the same sort of things, that God in love and mercy was working in your life to bring you to the point of salvation. After a person is saved, he or she wants others to hear the gospel so they too can be saved. If a person does not care about people being saved, then most likely he has never been saved himself. So you're explaining this gospel that we're talking about is a life-changing kind of thing. And it changed Paul, and it changed my life, and it can change your life. So we're dealing with a concept here that is, is going to bring changes in your life. Got a WhatsApp from Esme. I wish I could tell you about Esme. Dear sweet gal got saved not quite a year ago. We were doing Bible studies in her home. Now, I didn't realize this, but the JWs had been doing studies with her. I think was it five years? Long time. And they were simply trying to get her to sign on the dotted line of being. We started doing studies, and her testimony, she got saved about a month later. And her testimony was that on the first lesson of the studies right from the Bible, not twisting, I mean, God was just working here. She began to see, this is not what I've been learning. By the way, I have told people I am a JW. Initials of okay. That's the only reason David could become part of our family, because I'm a JD and my wife's a DJ, and all the kids are JD, DJ, JD, DD. He's a DJ. So he got to get in on it. And that's why JCD is a JD, okay? So, so you know, let all things be done decently and in order <laughs> when it comes to naming your kids. All right, the swamp. The second point here is found in verse number two, which he had promised a four. What's that mean? I'm not for scratching out a four and putting before, but that's what it means, and we need to tell our student that before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So this is this gospel is something the the Bible has talked about before by the prophets, and you can see that the study here is, and, and we would go down through this. God had predicted through the Old Testament prophets the coming gospel, and particularly His Son Jesus Christ. Many of these men wrote and spoke prophecies of Jesus who would come and die in our place for our sins. And then you would walk down through these. We won't for time's sake here this morning. But go to Isaiah 7.14 and what does that tell us? Well, Jesus would be born of a virgin. And 9.6 tells us some of Jesus' names. And 53.2 tells us that Jesus would look like a normal man. Fifty-three, five, and six. Jesus suffered and died in our place. And you could probably just park at any one of these verses, but uh, you know, and you have to be spirit-led. And really, I, I think that's the key. I don't think there's any "this will work" method. That's why, like, now, I'll, what a joy! We got the WhatsApp from Esme this morning, and she said that uh, Oliver that I mentioned the other night. She said, "What a joy it was to see him opening the service." reading the scriptures. Now this is a fella who was it? Memorized? Wow. Now here's a guy who got saved as a result of doing Bible studies. And the reason why we like to do that in that particular culture is because we want them to see that it's the word of God that they've got to 
deal with. I've got an answer to that. Because they're a polite people, and because I'm an older man, they would just assent to what I'm saying with, you know, here and not here. And so we want the Word of God to be quick and powerful and sharper than any piercing to the dividing of under soul and spirit and joints and marrow, getting right down to the very, very nitty gritty. All right? That's what's necessary. But he was a... We did Bible studies from October through June. So, yes, I'm not one, two, three, pray after me kind of a guy. Now, again, there may be some people that are prepared and ready, but I like to let the Word of God. Now, Esme, it was just about a month or so. Her husband-to-be still hasn't gotten saved, and he grew up in a quote-unquote gospel preaching home in another country. Dear, 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 dear person. I've known him for years. I've done Bible studies with him. And he's been coming to church. Okay? So it varies with people. But... You're working your way down through Mikey 5, 2. You know that. It tells us where Christ would be born. Zechariah 9, 9 tells us Jesus was just. He was perfect. Um, Zechariah 12, 10 tells us Jesus would be pierced. You see what we're doing? We're doing the same thing here in an elementary way. The pastor was talking about the other night. You know, the Christ that was promised, the anointed one, some of the verses that we looked at. You know, we're, we're pointing to Jesus even in the Old Testament because it's a book about Jesus. Right? And they're going to have to realize this gospel has to do with Christ. It's not me. Is Christ. And then we go on and talk about the person of the gospel, a little bit more about Jesus in chapters 1, 3 through 5. Uh, Romans 1, verses 3 through 5. Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. I read that a lot slower. Maybe explain some words. But my point is here, in our middle of page 2, that the person in the gospel, as you can probably already see, the gospel is about Jesus Christ. Christ is referred to many times in our passage. And then you go through these verses. And the word Christ is not always there. However, in verse 1 it's found, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Verse 3, concerning the Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God. Now, not called Christ there, but another, another name here. Okay, Son of God. Verse 5, by whom, there's a reference to the same person, Christ. We receive grace and apostleship. Uh, verse 6, Jesus Christ. Verse 7, at the very end, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, uh, Jesus Christ in the middle. Verse 9, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. And I, I might say, does it look like this chapter is about Jesus? Yeah. And, and, you know, if you don't assign him Acts 9 to read, you might say, okay, why don't you just go through the rest of your chapter here and just... Now, by the way, Africans like to underline every verse in the Bible. And I tell them, I say, you know, I say I'm not against underline, but I said, I don't underline everything in my Bible. I want to underline the things that really stand out to me. Now, you may have a different opinion, and that is an opinion, okay? You can do that. One of our early converts in Emmaus, um, he didn't like doing that because we were adding to the Bible. <laughs> okay? Take him a while to understand. No, that's not really adding to the Bible when you're underlining. All right, but, but I might say, okay, go through the rest of the chapter and just underline the references or make a little dot in your Bible or put on a piece of paper. And uh, by the way, Africans like to do that a lot. They get out a piece of paper and they want to write down references that they will go back and look at later. And so you say, okay, just go through the rest of chapter 1 there and just mark the verses that talk about Jesus, either with his name or some reference that you think. And I said, we're not going to be testing on this, but be a good prompting thing. And, and so then letter A, we deal with Jesus was a man. He had an earthly mother, Mary. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. I'm going to give them to you quickly. He was given human names. We looked at this verse, Matthew 1, 21. Yesterday, he developed like we do. Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, fear of God and man. He hungered. Matthew 4, 2. He thirsted. He slept. Number 6, he had a body. And number 7, he died. So Jesus was man. Then in verse 4, we find that Jesus was God. He had a heavenly father, God. So his dad was not like your dad. And that's a concept. Sometimes we use the word father. 
tell God, oh, God's a father. Well, my dad was a drunk. And my dad beat my wife, or my mom. And he beat us kids every time he was drunk. He was drunk all the time, and he never brought home money. And my mom had to go out and get a job just so he had money for school fees. So they would say, Jesus' father was different than, than, than our father. By the way, if you had a bad father, that doesn't mean you have to do what your bad father did. That means you can learn from him by not doing what he did. Okay. But Jesus' father was God. Okay, So Jesus came from God and was born like you and me. He had a heavenly father. Number one, he was called Lord 663 times in, in the New Testament. He was worshipped as God. Number three, he was called God. Number four, the Bible writers called him God. And number five, everything said about God in the Old Testament is also said about Jesus in the New Testament. Now, what we're trying to say is, okay, the gospel's about the Lord Jesus, and so we're just kind of laying a foundation about who Jesus was. See, if they don't understand who he was and to put their faith in just someone that's not the God-man who can save them, they're not going to get saved. It's a, it's a false Jesus, and there are a lot of false Jesuses out there. This... Zion Christian Church that has a leader out there in, and their headquarters is just, what, 15 miles down the road from us. And if you see them walking down the road, you can see them, they'll, they'll either have a star or they'll have a circle with a dove in there, depending on which branch they're part of. And every time that I've asked this question to one of them, here's what they say, here's the question I ask. Is Lacanyani Jesus? You know what they say? What do you think they say? Yes. So if you talk about believing in Jesus and trusting Jesus, they're thinking about this guy who's the head of 8 million people, and ha they have his picture up in their house because they believe that that picture can see the crooks, the sozies, and will scare them away. I talked to one guy. He says, yes, I pray. You know where he prays? Crosses from this side of the room to this side of the room, right underneath the picture, and he prays through that picture to his God. They even have songs about that. But they call themselves Christians, and so Barna and some of these guys, when they say Africa is Christianized, they're including these guys, and their Jesus is not our Jesus. So one of the reasons we're establishing this, because this person you're dealing with probably has heard of Jesus, but know absolutely nothing about it. So you're showing from the Bible who Jesus was. So they can understand this, the true gospel, and realize, I haven't accepted the true Jesus. I need the Bible Jesus. I need to be saved the Bible way. Now, who are the people for the gospel? Well, Romans 1, 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations. All nations. That means, okay, Jesus didn't come just for the white men in the Western culture. That's what the witch doctors want Africans to believe. He's the white. No. What does the Bible say? The Bible says all nations. Now, there is still a lot of tribalism. You know what I mean by that? If there isn't physical fighting, there's a lot of, you know, we might call it racism. We kind of only think that way. You know, maybe... Here's a white person that's against an Oriental, and an Oriental is against a black or whatever. But in Africa, tribalism runs deep. And if you're of this tribe, so I might say to a Sutu, um, Jesus died for you. And you know what? Jesus died for the Zulu. Or the Koza. Or the Zimbabwe. They don't like Zimbabwe. For the most part. Except the ones that got saved. The ones that got saved, you know, you know what they want to do? You know what they want to do? They want to get their passport and come with me up to Zimbabwe to see Brother Ruben. Salvation makes a difference. Yeah, that, 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 he is the answer, okay? This world's problems. So I show them that, and then, of course, Romans 1.14, I am a debtor both to the Greeks 
to the barbarians, the wise, the unwise, Romans 1.16. You can fill in blanks there. Then the question, does this sound like the gospel is for anyone anywhere? Now, that's what I believe, okay? And I, I imagine that this church believes this. <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't have me in. <laughs> the brand known me a long time, okay? So, that's the truth. But why is it the truth? Because it's in the Bible. That's what makes it true. Not just because they believe it. That doesn't make anything true. Just because you believe it. It's true because God is true. But God be true in every man alive. Now, the power of the gospel is found in verse 16. So, you see, now we skip, we're going to skip a lot of these verses that are important verses, okay? But our idea here is to get an unsaved person to sit down and understand some truth so they can be saved. And do you understand all of verse 5? And how long have you been saved? All right, so don't try to get a person with a, a mind that's not clear to try to understand a lot of detail. That's, you know... All right, so the power of the gospel, uh, 116, is dynamite powerful? Yes or no? Yes, it is. Some of you are a little hesitant about that. You don't know. The word, the word power in this verse is talking about that same type of power. Now, what's the other understanding of power? If you were in Africa and you lived under a king, that king has an authority. And sometimes the word power in the Bible is translated from authority. Romans 1.12. But here, it's that word, sounds like dynamite. That means, dynamite. and they might know what dynamite is. In Africa, they do a lot of mining. And so they will use dynamite to, you know, break up the, the soil, the mountain, whatever. So they understand that. And I say, that's powerful. The gospel is God's power to rescue a person from sin and hell. And I like to put it in that order, you know, sin and hell. Sinful habits, thoughts, and motives are very strong. Death, too, is unavoidable. Likewise, the devil with his temptations are no match for a person. The attack of the world with her foolish ways, ideas, advertisements, and programming is too much for people. Family and cultural ties hold nations in their grip. Is there anything stronger than all of these? Yes. It is the gospel that powerfully and completely frees a person from sin's bondage and eternal hell. Many people think they have power to stop sinning. And, and that's just reformation, not regeneration, isn't it? And that only works for a while. Uh, to do right all the time, to always have the right thoughts, to keep God's law perfectly, to please God. I'm sorry, did I get on? I'm on letter C there. I, I'm on letter C. Many people that have the power to stop sinning. All right, and I mentioned all these things. This is nothing but pride and a rejection of God's way found in the gospel. Now, what are some ways people use in an effort to be right with God? You can just, you know, fill in the blank. But what is the product of the gospel? Well, verse 17, for therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. Now, righteousness is a big word, so I try to say, okay, that, that means... Right. See that word right in there? Okay, don't let righteousness carry. God is right. God is true. And you're going to find the, the rightness of God and have that right standing with God in the gospel. That's, that's how. Now, the product of the gospel. These efforts that people take to be right with God are a rejection of the true way to be right with God. What they think is right right is really wrong. Our verse says, therein is the righteousness of God revealed, meaning in the gospel we find the righteousness of God. So, if one does not know the gospel and believe the gospel, there's absolutely no way that person can be right with God. Yet, if the gospel is preached, heard, and believed, then people can have a right standing with God. Letter B, how many times is the word faith found in this verse? Now you tell me. In verse 17, how many times is it found? Three times, okay? Three times. This is a key word in Romans being found nearly 40 times. Now you might have them count how many times in verse 17, but don't have them go all the way through Romans and, and count it. They're going to get bogged down. A similar word, by the way, did you get that 40, 40? Mm -hmm. A similar word is the word believe, which is found 24 times in the book. 
at the end of the day, and that's an expression we use over there, you know, at the end of the day, there really are only two ways to come to God. And, and by the way, I would change this. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. By faith in what he says, or by works in what one does. And I would change that a little bit. Um, there are two ways, how would you say that? The people, there's one way to come to God, you and I know that. But the two ways that people think they can come to God, one is belief, one is work, somehow that maybe needs to be reworded so that's understood. Because we certainly don't believe that it's by works a person. Now we believe if they generally came to God by faith, there will be works, you know. James makes that very clear. Okay? And then I said, more will be said about this in Romans chapter 3. All right, so that would be the first lesson that, again, yeah, and generally I try to keep my lessons to about an hour. Um, de depending on who you're dealing with, it may take them some time to assimilate. Which, and, we have to be careful because here we are, Bible Creek Church, we've stayed a long time, and we can just back up and dump the whole truck and bury them and realize that Wait a minute, this girl is a teller at Walgreens and she's from Sikh religion and she's never had a Bible open. But keep that in mind as you're dealing with precious souls. Now, we developed a series uh, about a year ago and it was entitled this Each One, Reach One, and Teach One. And it basically is a booklet that goes through four lessons on salvation and then lessons on discipleship. And the idea was to try to uh, encourage people to. Find a soul, pray for soul, find a soul that they could do, sit down and do a Bible study with. And so it's not so much adding the multiplication. You think if God gave you a precious soul at the beginning of 2016 to sit down and do a Bible study with, and it might, it might take, you know, three, four. What I've found is a lot of times we go through four or five lessons before they start asking questions. What's happening there? Well, the Spirit of God is working on them and finally starting to rattle their cage a little bit. So, you know, it may take a while. So you ought to be praying now, God, I, I want to lead somebody to Christ in 2016. And God, you just soul find doesn't that's fine? But, you know, asking it shall be given, seeking shall find. And then teach them. such. And so I would say, now, okay, now... And by the way, a lot of our guys have done this. They take the lessons that I give them, they turn around and they, they teach others. And that's what we want. Okay, so you might say, you know, you, you learn this, and maybe, maybe yeah, I guarantee you that, well, I shouldn't guarantee you, I don't know, but that Sikh girl probably has friends or family. And if she's bilingual, by the way, if some of you are bilingual, you know why you got saved? <laughs> okay, some of us are bilingual. So there are, there are groups of people that you can minister to that others can't. And that's incumbent, necessary for us to take that and share that with others. Okay, we need...